Lloyd, I might have a blinkered perspective of the Australian Red Cross. You filled me in beforehand that it's a much broader organisation than I know. Can you tell us about that? So the Red Cross has uh, one legal entity in Australia. Um, obviously, we're affiliated with the International Federation of Red Cross. Um, and our uh, entity in Australia splits into two divisions. We have a humanitarian division, um, which does all the good works in the field, and you see them usually bob up around floods and disasters and bushfires and all that sort of stuff. Um, the other division we have is our lifeblood division, which provides blood services. The two divisions are very, very different. Um, blood services uh, in lifeblood is really a, a regulated monopoly provider of blood uh, through to the government and CSL, and it operates as a high quality manufacturing operation. So it's raw materials of the blood that we, the community, provide, um, but it really produces high quality uh, blood services and blood uh, products uh, for the Australian community and health services, primarily to the Australian government health system. So the humanitarian side, you, know, you can see the blood services, regulated, controlled, and from my background as a manufacturing uh, person in automotive manufacturing, a uh, very attractive manufacturing operation, good control, nice quality, nice people and all the people you'd expect in that kind of environment. Humanitarian. Humanitarian operates on a $300 million budget. You go, what's well, $300 million? It's biggish. It's not huge. And let me understand the budget. Is that all government grants or is it a mixture of it's grants 50, and donations? It's 50-50. Yeah. Um, so we have 50-50 money that comes from the public through um, donations, regular giving, our retail operations. Uh, bequests, that kind of uh, thing, corporate partnerships. Our corporate partners are very generous and very kind with their time and also some of their finances to support the community. Um, but the other half, actually, we execute government programs. So the government might have a program to distribute food to people who are in towers that are in lockdown in COVID, for instance, mm -hmm. in COVID. So it's Red Cross staff that carry the food. Yeah. So um, there were people during COVID who didn't have work visas, who had no access to cash. The government did actually provide a lot of people with cash during that time. It's an organisation such as the Red Cross. We will provide the cash to people on behalf of the government. So but, but as you're talking there, Lloyd, I can't help feeling this is an organisation that needs to scale up and scale down quickly because these these could be spasmodic activity. It may be regular, but you're, you're, there's not a predictability yeah, about yeah, them. You're absolutely correct. Um, and whilst internally... Um, our data, you know, isn't perfect around the, the, these numbers, um, which I'm seeking to improve. But the kind of concept I can give you is we have around about 1,800 staff, some full-time, some part-time, on our on our books. <clears throat> now, traditionally, people would think of you $300 million, $1,800, 1,800 staff. At any given time, we, we have around about 22,000 volunteers, a lot of whom are part-time. And we also have 11,000 members, right? Um, crossing over between members and volunteers. So you look at that and you say, actually, we're an organisation potentially of 25,000 people. At any given moment, we're probably four or 5,000 FTE. Well, during the bushfires, we went from four or 5,000 FTE um, before the bushfires, working in shops, doing the normal things in an office that you do to prepare for things, to 20,000 people in the field mm -hmm. in two weeks. <clears throat> so you scale to four times your size in hundreds of locations within a 14-day period, oh, and by the way, you're going to accept m more than 100% of your revenue in a 14-day period, right, without any warning. Yeah. Right? Yeah. From yeah. an event that you don't know. But I'm looking at the, at the traditional CFO type role. It's how do you allocate scarce resources to the most need is, sure. is the task. Sure. Uh, and also the, the challenge of the governance of those monies. I, I can imagine that would almost be a cost containment mentality that would be focused. It is. It, and traditionally, it has been a cost containment mentality. And certainly, um, certainly we're frugal. Mm -hmm. Right, frugality just goes without saying. Yeah, yeah, you know, we are not a, we're not going to be best of breed in any of our back of house. We're going to be fit for purpose, mm -hmm. but we're not going to be best of breed. So we're going to be frugal. But what we really need to be is concentrating um, our efforts on becoming scalable. So when we when we look at something, we need to be able to invest it so that we're scalable and able to meet the challenges that come to our way. 
that scalability has got to come with the concept of keeping our people safe in the field and everyone that we, we work with, keeping them safe too, mm. um, because the people that we work with are in need. So by definition, we've got to extend them care. So um, that scalability concept is really key here. And it's very difficult to measure us on traditional measures. Um, the other thing is traditionally humanitarians don't measure the good that they do. They don't quantify it. Mm. So it's very difficult to talk about how much good you do if you don't measure it. So mm. there's, there's one of our key metrics that we're going to have to work for is, is to be able to use technology to be able to embed this measurement of um, how much good we do, what social impact. Yeah, you know, yeah. Is, is but I'm seeing the digitization then lends itself to automation of processes. Oh, absolutely. So am I, am I hearing you say the perspective you're taking is how can we make the monies we have yeah. go farther? Oh, to, in today's paradigm, yeah. the ability to be able to leverage technology and data, right, um, to make your dollar go further is just undeniable. And the ability in this space to be able to do that in, in the for-purpose sector is got to be, I think, the biggest single opportunity that we can have. Um, so it's exactly that. It's meeting with the partners here at something like CFO Edge, where my last meeting was just with Workday. All right? That kind of space is the big, one of the biggest leverage opportunities that we can have. Um, and that way we can preserve our dollars. If we invest in the right technology, we can be completely scalable and we can preserve our dollars to be able to spend on people in need. And I can actually preserve another layer to get people who are really good at providing services to people in need. And I can spend the money on that. How do you as a leader take your team on a journey? People who may see their role in more traditional accounting perspective. I know you've got more than finance in your team, but the finance people, you've got a team of 80, that's quite sizable. How do you bring them on the journey of how digitization empowers the business? That's an educative process, uh, iterative. Um, you know, in other words, it takes, it takes time. Um, some people aren't going to make it. Some people just want to, they're very happy in the paradigm the last paradigm that we had. Yeah. And so some people aren't going to make it through that journey. So you've got to respect that. That's not where everyone's going to be at. But I think it really is about education and being able to lay out what a vision looks like and then be able to sit with people in an, in an open culture and be able to walk through their fears, walk through their education gaps and be able to say, we're going on that journey. We can plot that path together, mm. you know, and we can mutually plot a path um, to get to that point. But we need to get to that point. And most people will come along, funnily enough. Um, most people actually have that innate aspiration in there. They want to make their numbers mean something more. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. They, want to, they want the numbers to be able to have an empowering narrative and be able to inform decisions. So really what, you're, what we're trying to build out is an awareness of how you execute that in a different environment. And I suppose that a lot of people in the Red Cross are there because they have a, a sense of purpose. They want to do something in their community. So, so you're tapping into that aspiration. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, interestingly enough, but one of the key challenges here, apart from just really the, the, the management exercise of connecting 25,000 people together to do different projects yeah. right, that, that you've got, because we're a services provider that works in project chunks. Um, apart from that, just simple management exercise. The connection of people with purpose, um, the, the thing I would say about the Red Cross is we look for impact through connection. That's really us, connecting community to community, connecting donors to a sense of purpose, connecting volunteers to a sense of purpose, connecting people within the Red Cross to each other to form a sense of community. So I think you're looking for those connection points and connecting with purpose. The other part of technology that we might be able to bridge is that when someone comes in and presents themselves to the Red Cross and said, hey, I've got some time or I've got some money, we'll actually be able to connect and say, you know what, that four hours you gave us, you made a difference. Yeah. That 50 yeah. bucks you gave us, it went there and it made a difference. Yeah. And you'll be able to demonstrate that connection. So that because everything is digitized, it's easier to track impact that you're having with the monies. It is. We should be able to measure it. If I can measure it, I can correlate it. Okay. And so that, that connection of purpose, that becomes then not a data exercise. It becomes very human. Yeah. Because we're all searching for a connection with our purpose. Yeah. And look, to be honest, the Red Cross is connection with purpose exponentially <laughs> multiplied, not linear. But it can also be a bit of a, a curse to have that sort of passion that you're dealing with and that sort of you're challenging people at times and, yeah. that, and that can be tough. Yeah. 
Look, um, I think where you're challenging them is not in the sense of purpose. Yeah. I think how you're challenging them is how they prosecute that. Yeah. And so, but again, that's that's really sitting down. This is where culture is important, to be able to sit down in an open dialogue and say, hey, it could look like this. Let's just sit down and plot that path together. Um, might not always be the one you want, but provided it goes over there, does it really matter? Yeah. I think that's the way you can navigate that. Um, and then I think you can bring people's purpose to life even better, which is a paradox that data would bring a closer connection with purpose for people. <laughs> well, it gives clarity, perhaps. Yeah, it does. It yeah. does. And so, you know, it's a, it's a joy to be able to work there. So from someone who traditionally isn't in the full purpose sector, uh, sector, you know, automotive manufacturing, wine packaging, that sort of stuff, um, yeah, this is a, a special time to be here. But you bring those disciplines to a, to a different organisation. Good organisation, good process is good organisation and good process. doesn't matter what type of organisation it is. Thank you.